singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. If you guys enjoy the show, you can help me make it better in one of several ways. You can simply click the like button and give thumbs up on the video on YouTube. You can write a review of the show on iTunes. You can leave a comment on the blog, or you can simply make a donation. As always, I will be the man with the questions, and today the man with the answers will be Jacques Fresco. Jacques Fresco is a futurist, inventor, social engineer, visionary, and technician who has been called a modern-day Da Vinci or and the new Buckminster Fuller. Most notably, Jacques is best known for his Venus project. So welcome, Jacques. I'm very happy to have you on Singularity One-on-One. I consider it an honor to be on your show. Thanks very much, Jacques, but I think the honor is entirely ours. <laughs> So, uh, you know, Jacques, let me start like this. I used a lot of adjectives, a lot of different words to describe who you are. But I know that you're very peculiar, very particular with language. So I want to ask you to tell us who you are in your own one or two words. I'm just an individual that's interested in a better world, a peaceful world a world without poverty, war, and most of the problems we have today. That's my major concerns. So, <laughs> that's very interesting. I did not expect that one. So, But that reminds me of another term. Would it be to, proper to say that in that sense, then maybe you're a peaceful warrior of a sort? Yes, if you wish. <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, what's the best way to accomplish that goal that you're struggling, stru- working on? Well, it's not easy, but it would require uh, that all the world's resources become the common heritage of all the world's people. That's an absolute. If some nations control the water and the arable land, there will always be territorial disputes and war unless you share the resources with every other country. In other words, eventually have to do away with the artificial boundaries that separate people and bring them all together because we all have to protect the oceans, the rivers, the atmosphere. We're all subject to that. So we all have to join forces and become as one nation because all people need the same thing, clean air, clean water, a relevant education, and a good understanding of one another. You can't do that today with Mm -hmm. separate nations. So are those things that you just listed the major problems that humanity is facing today? And they were mainly environmental, clean air, clean water, remove pollution, etc. Scarcity, too. Scarcity, okay. Anything else? No. Things like uh, knowledge. They need a great deal of knowledge about the earth, about trees, about nature, how we relate to nature and to one another. Mm -hmm. How about issues like, I don't know, nuclear proliferation, weapons of mass destruction, terrorism? All, All that's done because of a money system. We use money. And as long as you use money, you can pay off senators, congressmen, it's not a legitimate, nor a good system, nor is it democratic. So, but help me see a little bit better how money is the cause for, for example, nuclear weapon proliferation. We want the resources of other countries. We don't go to war to bring democracy. We go to war because they have things we need. Cheap labor, oil, or something like that. Other than that, we don't concern ourselves with it. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, you're going to... That goes back- for all nations, not just our nation. They are all basically corrupt. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, you're basically going to the argument of scarcity, that wars are a result of scarcity. Yes, or the fear of scarcity. Or the fear of scarcity, I see. Okay. And so... 
in that sense, would it be fair to say that the Venus project is your solution of how we go on to uh, overcome the limitations of scarcity? Survival for everybody. Mm -hmm. If we continue the way we are, we will go to war because everybody is making nuclear weapons and they don't know how to solve our problems. Mm -hmm. Our politicians are completely unaware of what the problems really are. They talk around the subject. They never point to the shortcomings of the culture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think this is the time perhaps that you could tell us a little bit more about uh, your very well-known Venus Project. What is it? Well, the Venus Project says if you want a world without war, without poverty, unemployment, and most of the problems that you have today, you must declare all the Earth's resources as the common heritage of all the world's people. You have to remove all the artificial boundaries and, and evolve a language that's not subject to interpretation. Today, all language is subject to interpretation. And it can't work. Is that why you say that uh, we need a new language, one that is not subject to interpretation. Exactly that. Mathematics, chemistry, physics, biology, is not subject to interpretation. When the chemist writes a formula, no matter where he presents it, it's interpreted the same way. It's not interpreted in terms, I think he means this, or I think he means that. No. A language is understood all over the world. Mathematics is understood all over the world. Yeah. There's no Greek way to build an airplane or a Spanish way. There's a mathematical way. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you as far as science goes, but wouldn't that make us, artistically speaking, a lot poorer? Because imagine Shakespeare or, uh, I don't know, T.S. Eliot or any other of the great poets and one of the reasons, and art in general, one of the reasons why art breaches uh, the gap and reaches into so many people is because everybody finds something of their own in it, precisely because it's subject to interpretation, pre precisely because of the ambiguity in language. So it's also dangerous. It is dangerous, but it's a double-edged sword. It is dangerous in, if you're building airplanes and bridges that can crash or fall. But on the other hand, if you're talking about poetry or art... I'm not talking about poetry or art. I'm talking about survival of the world's people. They can't survive on poetry and art. <laughs> they need electric lights, power generators, automation. They need these things in order to survive. Otherwise, you're going to have to pull boats along the Hudson River, the Volga River. <laughs> you're going to have humans pulling boats. All right. So, um, why did you name the the project with the the name Venus, the Venus Project? Because we started it in Venus, Florida. Because Venus had the land we needed and the resources we needed to get started. It's in Venus, and Venus is about the middle of the state. Mm hmm. Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, based on my research that I've done before this interview, I, I've seen lots of pictures and clips and videos from what you've done there, and I personally would love to be able to come and visit and take a day tour of your facilities and the amazing work that you've done there, because it, it looks really impressive to me. Yes, you'll have to come on Saturday. That's tour day. Oh, fantastic. Saturday at 1 o'clock. So, does that mean that anyone who's watching this... Uh, can come over and visit you on Saturdays at one uh, p after one p.m. Yes. Oh, that's. But they have to look into it. Look into the requirements for coming. I see. On the internet. Okay, great. So mm -hmm. I'm going to put the link there to into the show notes so that people can look into that and click it and and find out yeah. more. But let's move on with our interview here. So. One of the things that you once said that really bugged me was the majority of people today are unsane. Yes. Can you tell us what do you mean by unsane? If you're brought up under Hitler, 
get brought up under a lot of values that had never been tested, that had never been verified, just opinions. Mm -hmm. Unsane means uh, saying that we won't get to the moon in a thousand years. That's unsane. The proper answer is, I don't know enough about rockets to give you that answer. I don't know enough about survival in space. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But people have opinions about anything. Because people have been brought up to believe that everyone should have a right to their own opinion. I think that's dangerous. They should have access to the facts, not their own opinion. Mm -hmm. That kind of reminds me, by the way, very much to what Socrates used to say. He used to say, if there's anything that I do know is that I don't know, but you don't know, and that's why you think you do know. Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, so um, the next other interesting, one other interesting thing connecting to do that you, you, you've said before is that there's no such thing as a thinking man. because He can't. Can you elaborate yes. on that a little bit more, too? I can only try. Uh, when I say a thinking man, it's very difficult for an Eskimo who's never been around, who just built ice igloos, to think of a twin-engine Beechcraft. He can't think of a Mercedes. If you ask an Eskimo, <laughs> what do you want? You can have anything you want. He will never ask for a Mercedes or a twin-engine Beechcraft because he doesn't even know they exist. That's what I mean, that people are imprisoned by their culture. Mm -hmm. If you were brought up as a baby in Nazi Germany, after Hitler burned the books, all you see is Heil Hitler, Deutschland over alles, Germany above all. Well, you can't think outside of that if you're not exposed to other ideas. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, we're all children of the environment that we grow yes. up in. we're victims of the culture we grew up in. Mm -hmm. And is that true to you, about you too? No, because I was not brought up in the same environment most people are. I left school when I was 13 or 14. So I was exposed to a very different kind of environment. I was exposed to the Great Depression. In 1929, I saw millions of people unemployed lose their jobs. I saw signs on factories, no help wanted. And I saw soup kitchens and thousands of people sleeping in the park and people with ideas like mankind united, technocracy, socialism, communism, free enterprise. There were people up on soapboxes talking about all different kinds of systems. Mm -hmm. But none of the systems I heard of were accurate. They were a lot of opinions in there and a lot of speculation. Mm -hmm. And I don't want speculation. Scientists never tell you that this is the strongest material in the world. They put it in a machine, twist it, pull it, compress it, and they give you a report on the characteristics of that metal. Mm -hmm. Not only that, they tell you what the object is made of, nickel and titanium and cobalt. They tell you what is inside that metal. Politicians, well, let me say this carefully so you don't misunderstand me. They don't know a damn thing. <laughs> I, I, I asked a politician once, how can you prevent war? He said, I don't know. I said, how can you grow more food to feed the world's hungry? He says, I don't know that either. How can you conduct electricity over long lines without tremendous losses? They don't know. They don't know anything real. And I've tried it, but I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to ask politicians the same questions. Mm -hmm. They really don't know how to get us out of this. Yeah, I agree with you about asking questions very much. I mean, this is what I do on my show. Uh, and, but I want to ask you something else, too. Another group of people that you often mention, besides politicians, is philosophers. Yeah. And I have an engineering friend of mine who often tells me, uh, we're very good friends, uh, he often tells me that philosophers are all bullshitters because he's an engineer and he says, you know, when I built this or when I built that, you can touch it, you can see it, you can feel it. All you guys do is make, you know, 
pies in the sky. You make, you know, castles in the clouds, and they're all bullshit. Do you agree with that statement? Pretty much. Not entirely. Philosophers have some good ideas, but to know the difference is a problem. To know what it is that makes sense that they say. There's a lot of bullshit or BS in philosophy, but knowing the difference is a problem. And how can we know, how can we know that difference in philosophy then? Well, the only way I know of is uh, that science is not perfect, but it's closer to reality than any other system I know of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, are you an empiricist? Would you call yourself an empiricist then? I suppose so. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to your Venus project, because that's, of course, the main reason why we're here today. So, is it, was it the witnessing of the Great Depression that made you begin thinking and begin working on the Venus project? Not only that, but a lot of things within the Great Depression, criticizing other countries, making up false things about them. So it's very hard to know what the truth is if you're brought up in Nazi Germany or France or England or any other country. All countries try to teach patriotism. They try to get people to conform to the culture. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, that's not science. Scientists do not conform to the culture. If most people believe the earth is flat, they say you're wrong. This is why it's not flat. And they show the evidence to prove that the earth is round. They show their evidence. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like it, come up with counter evidence. They never do. I they see. still believe the earth is flat. Mm -hmm. So, one of the other things that you said about the Venus Project is that we have to uh, uh, abolish the national boundaries and, and nation states as units. And I very much agree with you that, uh, you know, national boundaries, especially the geographical national boundaries, are merely historical artifacts in my view, and we're much better off without them. Unfortunately, though, don't you think that the world suffers from too much petty nationalism and ethnocentrism? And That's racism? the only way they think they can survive. They can't. They're wrong in that area. There's been more wars uh, lately. U.S. has wars all over the place. All nations are fighting each other. They don't even know what the problem is. They can't even state the problem. <laughs> if you get a revolution in Egypt, they don't know what to put it in place, even if they won. You understand what I mean? Yeah. They have no idea of what's missing. Well, some people have come up to say that they do know what's the problem, so... Uh, Samuel Huntington, for example, famously uh, came up with an argument uh, a decade or two ago called the Clash of Civilizations, for example, where he sort of divides the world on sort of east and west. Some uh, later, uh, you know, people have come up and said that, you know, we have that sort of uh, terrorism uh, exhibited clash between the East and the West along the lines that Samuel Huntington proposed because the, the value system of the Western capitalist democratic world is clashing with sort of the Eastern conservative traditionalism and especially Islam. What do you think yeah. of that? I think it's true. I think that different nations come up with different ideas and they think their ideas are real. A lot of them are not. They're based on theory and hope, that is their own facts. In other words, when the government asked scientists, can you put a man on the moon? They said, we don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I thought you guys could do anything. <laughs> they, said, uh, they said this, we don't know what a man can stand. So we have to put him in a centrifuge and whirl him around and find out when he conks out if it's nine times gravity that he comes out, we can't take off too fast. We can't give him a glass of water on a spaceship, because if he tilts the glass, the water will come out all over the place. <laughs> so he has to put water in a rubber tube and squeeze it into the mouth. Yeah. You understand? That's what they mean by they don't know. And if you put a man in space, the calcium from his bones disappear. 
That's what they mean by they don't know. Mm -hmm. So, but going back to the <coughs> sort of so-called clash of civilizations, I personally don't really accept that argument, to say the least, but how do we go about resolving those issues? I think the only way is education. Mm -hmm. To educate people in basic science. How scientists make decisions. Mm -hmm. They really don't make decisions. They arrive at them. Do you know the difference? Absolutely. Put it to test. Yeah. Don't make decisions. Follow and the evidence know. no matter where it takes you, right? Yes, no matter where it takes you. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry about that. I wish it was nice, but it isn't. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, okay, so one of the things that you said that we need to begin with in order to start implementing the, the Venus project is a, a global survey to find out the carrying capacity of the Earth, to find out what we've damaged, how badly it's damaged, and to sort of extrapolate of, you know, how much of a population can we support and so on. Yeah. Now, I agree with that entirely on the survey part. On the other hand, the carrying capacity of any lot of land depends entirely on the technology that you apply to to, to, to produce anything from it, right? right. And if oh, you look at it right. historically, the carrying capacity has grown almost <laughs> exponentially yes. of a given plot of land, simply because we've learned so much about agriculture, you know, about irrigation, about, you know, creating better crops and all that, which has given increasingly higher and higher yields. And we are losing a lot of topsoil. <clears throat> we are spraying poisons on plants which contaminate the groundwater. See, we're not scientific in all areas. <clears throat> we are just scientific in some areas. Mm -hmm. but, but my point was that, you know, we cannot really find the carrying capacity of the Earth because it depends on the technology. As technology is improving, the carrying capacity would improve yes. too. It's not As a constant it improved, factor. You're right. As it improves, we change the information. Uh -huh. But until we get that information, we can't change it. Mm -hmm. I see. I we see. have to say, I don't know until you do more research on that. I see. So, Jacques... How many years have you been working on the Venus Project so far? About 75 years. I'm uh, 96 years old, 97 now. 97 and 75. So that means you were 22 when you were starting. Starting. Yeah. Just, well, a little younger. 14, I would say. So you've been working on this for three quarters of a century. Yes. And do you think that you're making any progress? Only recently I've been working on it to solve the problems first. Mm -hmm. How do you solve the schools? What are you going to educate people to? What will education be like? What will life be like? Many questions before I launched it on society. It took me 75 years to get all this together. So most people don't put things together. The geologists study the surface of the earth and geological phenomena. Meteorologists study the weather. That isn't science. Science is the study of all things that affect human beings. They have to be together. A, a meteorologist has difficulty talking to a sociologist because they don't understand each other. And you can't teach science in bits. You have to bring it all together. Science is a way of thinking, a way of arriving at conclusions without your own opinion. Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, one one other time you said that science is basically uh, coming up with the most probable thing that would come up next. Yes, but that only means, and in our country we have vested interests. Scientists work for corporations. Once they do that, they work for a dictatorship. Once you punch a client time clock and go to work, it's a dictatorship. Mm. 
Do you understand that? They don't ask you when you come in to a factory, what are your major areas of interest? If you say human beings, I like to work with children, they don't send you to the children's center. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as democracy. All these are artificial terms to get people to control people. The same with religion. Mm -hmm. Mine was a li my point was though a little bit different. My point was uh, along the lines of trying to guess what's the most probable next thing. My point was to ask you, what is your own guess about the probability of success of the Venus Project? Very low, unless people do things, unless people get up and talk to other people. But don't put the problems on us. We have a lot of work to do, and we don't have the finances to do it. So we need the participation and the education of most people in most countries. We just got back about a year ago from a lecture tour over the whole world presenting the Venus Project. Mm -hmm. And the most questions that people ask are all related to the old world. They can't ask new questions. Mm -hmm. You know, I say, what if two guys are in love with the same girl? You know, all the typical <laughs> problems. They have, they can't think outside of that. Mm -hmm. But do you not think that some of that would indeed happen even in the new world? Like, yes, two guys would fall in love with the same girl? No, they will not. No? No. Because they'll know that, that they rejected a lot of women. Women rejected a lot of men. You know, rejection is not uncommon. When you understand when you're rejected, it means you don't meet their values. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. Do you understand that? Uh. It's you're rejecting a value system or behavior or appearance. There's no such thing as beauty. We, we invent those words. If everybody had a pointed head and horns, that would be beautiful to you. Mm -hmm. But when you bring up people to believe that some girls are beautiful and some are not, you protect prejudicing people in a given area. A beauty contest is a nothing thing. It proves nothing, it adds nothing to the culture, but falsehood. Yeah, that presumes that love is a result of beauty, but what if we're talking about the deeper love, the one that, for example, Aristotle was talking about when the, the best love that Aristotle described was when two people are, are in love with the same virtues, not no, with each other. That doesn't happen, because they're not brought up in the same environment. If you're brought up in France, you say, La Tour de Fale, the Eiffel Tower, <laughs> and you think differently about the Eiffel than the Americans do. You can't share the same values unless you're brought up in science, no matter where you go in the world. If you're a scientist, you can share values with other scientists. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, let's say, take two scientists at CERN in Switzerland. One could be from, I don't know, uh, Mumbai, and another one could be from Canada, and a third one could be from Venus, Florida. And they all work on the CERN project, and the two guys fall in love with the girl from Mumbai. Well, that's because they haven't been educated in the meaning of love. Let me tell you what love is from a scientific point of yes, view. Yes, please. Love is being extensional to one another. Do you know what that means? When you meet a girl, you don't say, I love your smile, your dimples. I love the way your hair falls over your shoulders. That's seductive behavior. That is not love. What and most is men, love? love is being extensional, giving people ideas and ways of thinking that help them grow. That's love. To teach a child how to think about things in a scientific way is really caring. Mm -hmm. But if you teach them your way of thinking, that's not scientific. Mm -hmm. If so you say to your daughter, don't play with that girl. You're a Lutheran. She's a Catholic. The mother means well, but she doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mothers don't know how to raise children. You know, I'll give you a funny sideline story, and then we'll go back on topic just briefly. But me and my wife, we're very different. You know, I come from Eastern Europe. She was brought up in a very uh, traditional American Republican family. She was Catholic. I'm an atheist. 
Uh, I'm sort of left wing le- leaning. She's she was right wing leaning. I am sort of very logical. She's very artistic. So in the beginning, we were like complete opposites, and we had lots of issues to work through. But we made it work, and we've been together for almost ten years now, despite those different value systems that we came out of. I wouldn't agree with you. I would think you're putting up with a lot of stuff you don't believe in. No, actually, I don't feel like I'm putting up with anything because we've managed to resolve all those differences, and we've kind of we've both made some kind of a journey towards the middle ground. I think so. She changed in many ways. I changed in many other ways. Oh, you do change. Yeah, that's extensional. Oh, I that's see. what I mean by extensional. Yeah, because we you met somewhere her. in the middle, or I don't know where, but in a new place. Yeah, well, well, that's more extensional than love. Love is just a word. The guy says, "I love you." You don't know what he means by that. Mm-hmm. What does he mean? He doesn't even know himself. That's why I can't tell you. When you ask an artist, "How do you create all these wonderful things?" They say, "I don't know. It just comes to me." They don't know. If you ask an inventor, "How do you invent things?" He always says. I don't know. I was just eating one day, and I thought of it. He doesn't know, but there's a process. He doesn't know anything about. I know where every invention I ever made comes from. Tell us a little bit from. Give us a couple examples. Where, for example, does the Venus Project come from specifically? Can you give us seeing, some? seeing misery, unemployment, war, all those things, horrible, free opinions, free thinking, where everybody has a right. To their own opinion, all of those things, when you check them out, don't work.、Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's move on, and we might touch again on those、uh, subjects in a, in, a, in a bit. But you say that human nature is a myth used to keep things the way they are. Yes. In other words, when you're brought up in France, they don't ask you what your nature is; they t- tell you what to think, how what it means to be a Frenchman. What it means to be an American? They can't tell you that.、Mm-hmm. Where did America get this land? They stole it from the Indians. Yeah, the Indians did not say, "Come on over, build whatever you want." The Indians <laughs> fought back, and they lost.、Mm-hmm. But but we, not only that, George Washington had three hundred slaves. He'd have been thrown out of the country if he were alive today. Human nature is an excuse. They think that humans are born that way because they all seem to be greedy. When you meet with children, they all say the same thing: "I, I can run faster than you. I bet I can fight you." If they're brought up in a competitive society, that's the way they talk. They talk.、Mm-hmm. If they're brought up in a cooperative society, they say, "You probably can run faster than me." So what? What does it matter? So, In a competitive society, it matters. So I, I want to push you a little bit more on those things about nature, because, like you, I agree to to the degree that I'd say a very large chunk, perhaps the largest chunk of us, of of our so-called human nature, is created by the environment. But I'm not、yeah. sure if it's as large as you would make it out to be. I,、mm-hmm. I would say. Certainly, over fifty percent, maybe even closer to ninety percent. But I would say there is still some stuff which is inborn. For example,、um, how do we explain variations between, say, people who grew up in the same environment and came up with completely different、uh, outcome or reactions to it? If you stamp out a fender in a factory and it doesn't get come out right, it means you got the wrong machine. There's no such thing as the same environment. Every human being, when you have two kids in the family, if you treat the younger kid with priority, you make jealousy and envy in the older kid. If you play with a three-year-old and the younger kid is standing at seven years old with that lower lip out, you know, and crying, and you say, "What's the matter?" They don't say anything because. You must not do that. You have to put the young kid on your lap and the older kid, and say, "I love you both." Never play with the younger kid, or never use one kid against the other. 
You can't say you can go to the movie, but you can't because you didn't do your homework. That makes envy and jealousy. That's where it comes from. It isn't inborn. Did you know that if you raise dogs without other dogs around, they try to have sex with you? They get up on your knee? And all sex is determined by environment, movies, books you read, people you know. There is no such thing as an inborn sexual drive. Oh, that's very interesting. So, so you would say that even the, the so-called deepest urges to, for example, procreate, they are also... There's no urge to, to procreate. There's urge to have sex. <laughs> they don't even know, know they're procreating. <laughs> a lot of primitive people didn't know where babies came from. So you are prepared to say that 100% of who we are is a result of the environment, no less than 100%. I don't know of anything that's not. Let me put it this way. Every word you use, your mother said, cup, table, light, over and over again. So all the words you use, you never have your own words. And a child born in China never was born speaking Chinese. Even though they spoke Chinese for generations, the Chinese baby does not learn Chinese any faster than an English baby. They tried that experiment. They thought that the Chinese baby would learn to speak Chinese better and faster. But it's not true. There's a lot of projection. You know what that means? Mm -hmm. People project their own values into things. And that's what louses up society. So, isn't that view, I mean, to, to some, to some, I, I don't know, that view strikes me a little bit determinate, or a lot deterministic. I mean, there's no room for personal choice, there's no room for free will. It almost sounds like as if we're sort of like meaning-making machines that are entirely molded by the world around us, and we're yeah. just sort of following that input and converting it into output without any... But, but it, feels like, it feels like we're making our own decisions. Yeah. Nobody ever comes into my store and asks for an armored suit. A suit of armor. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't exist. And the elevator operators can't get a job today because the elevators stop themselves on the fourth floor or tenth floor when the button you press. Mm -hmm. The sooner you automate, the better. The sooner you make a government of machines, the better your world. As long as you have people with different values, you're going to have clashes. Republicans do not talk to Democrats. Nobody has free will, although they teach you that you make your own decisions. Mm -hmm. You don't. If you're brought up in a Republican environment, only you tend to be a Republican. If you're brought up between the two, you say, I'm not sure. Even that decision, I'm not sure, comes from a liberal environment. I think it kind of works either against. It's like, you know, if you are brought up in a certain environment, you either tend to embrace it entirely wholeheartedly or you tend to fight it. You tend to... If, if, if the people who are Republicans manifest that viewpoint, but if you feel your parents do not manifest the viewpoint, you might disagree with it. They were looking about a year ago, they were looking for the Republican gene. Did you know that? <laughs> How stupid can you be? Even <laughs> geneticists are people, and they're convinced by people. They were looking for the gene that makes a person gay. There's no gene that makes a person gay. They're brought up in an environment that's different than the one you were brought up in. If you were brought up by three women that had effeminate mannerisms, then you can only express yourself with effeminate mannerisms. You don't learn anything else. If you're brought up in a Nazi culture, you're a Nazi, unless you've read books or traveled a lot. Uh -huh. If you were brought up in Australia, you'd say to me, how are you, mate? <laughs> well, I accept the Australian and the Nazi example. I'm not so sure I accept the, the women example for for. Well, that's not. Gay. Where do you think it comes from? Heaven? No, certainly you not. You think it's heaven, in, in the genes? I, no, I don't think it's in the genes too. I just think it's a little bit more subtle than. Well, you think that the brain is a female brain, 
in, say, in the male body. There's more male hormones in the male body than female hormones. So all those geneticists, are, a lot of them are full of shit, is what I'm trying to tell you. Mm-hmm. They're not scientific. Mm-hmm. So, so does that mean that you, you said, you t- spoke about optimization and how, you know, elevator operators were replaced by elevators and people, the better, the sooner we automatize everything, the better off we are. But does that mean that in a way you could say we are all machines? We are just biological machines. Yes, I'm saying that. Oh, that's but great. it's not very pleasant to people that are brought up with more romantic notions. That's why I'm afraid of poets, artists, and people who think that they have creativity. They don't. An artist is made. I can teach anyone to draw. There's no such thing as talent. Some teachers don't know how to teach. That's what the problem is. Well, Well, I certainly would love to come and spend an hour with you teaching me to draw because I suck at it so bad. I'm just horrendous at I understand that. that. I understand your predicament. (laughs) And I've met met thousands of people. All my friends were different religions. First thing I had to do was take away their religion so they can talk to each other Uh and introduce them to science, which I did. And when mothers used to see me coming, they used to pull their kids in the house because mm-hmm. they were afraid they'd be contaminated. Mm-hmm. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. I understand all that. I'm not against that. I just said, if we continue the way we're going, we are not civilized yet. As long as nations has armies, navies, prisons, and police, we are not civilized. Mm-hmm. We're only civilized if people learn how to relate to nature and one another. Where they don't argue with each other, they don't even go to see a prize fight. Because in fighting, you damage the brain of the other person. And everybody loves a good fight. Everybody loves a good football game. They're all distractions. Distractions from the world of reality. Of course a lot of people are going to get mad at that. Of course a lot of Nazis would hate what I say. I understand that. Would you say that's that football games and boxing or, or whatever is just a, a modern example of the ancient Roman principles of... Yes, exactly. Spectacles? Exactly that. Mm-hmm. But you can't tell that to people that have been brought up that way. To them it looks perfectly legitimate and makes sense. Mm-hmm. We just weren't looking for the best fighter. Even... When I went to the South Pacific looking for certain truths, I wondered whether man's reaction to women was inborn or was it environmental. I said, I don't know at that time. So I went to the South Sea Islands, and when I got to Tuamotu, everybody walked around without clothing. Children used to swim nude, and the adults wore no clothing. And I never saw a male stare at a female's body, only their eyes. And there were no peeping toms on the island. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because <laughs> yeah. if everybody wears no clothing, there are no peeping toms. And there were no fetishes. There were no tit men, ass men, leg men, hair men, who love the way your hair falls. That was not conditioned on the islands. So there was no fetishes, no panorama, no, no propaganda. Mm-hmm. There was none just talking about the food of the islands and the fish. Uh-huh. And when they pulled in a net fish, a net full of fish, they threw it to anyone standing there. They didn't say, you owe me five bucks, you owe me three bucks, none of that. And they were very cooperative. Uh-huh. So you think that cooperation and or... I don't think. I know that since I've been to the islands. Very well. Okay, I, I accept that correction. So, uh, there was no pornography. Nobody collected pictures of nude women and hung them up on a wall. There were no magazines showing nude women because they were brought up nude. If boys and girls in America swam nude when they were very young, there would be no peeping toms. So do you think we should be naturalist in that sense and go along without clothes and stuff? And what is naturalism? You gotta pin that down yeah, so it's scientific. I'm just taking, taking it on the surface, you know, as people who don't wear clothes, just like the natives of that li- island you're describing. Yes. Yes. 
they would not stare at a nude body. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is that an example of what you call a resource-based economy? Yes, in the future. But this can't happen right away. It's going to take so long to undo all the crap pumped into your head. Mm -hmm. Like patriotism, natural ability, a genius. When a person says they're born with that ability, they have talent. All those words are bullshit words. Well, it's better to say, I don't know what makes a good artist. I don't know what makes a good scientist, rather than stick your own opinion in there. That's what louses up the world. Well, many people have described you as a genius in a way, but you are one... I don't one... care about that. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay, let's go back on topic then. Can you elaborate, please, a little bit more about what do you mean by resource-based economy? How is that going to work in the... Venus Project future. There'd be no money, no trade, no credit, no banks, no bankers, no investment bankers, no advertising. And all schools would teach science and our relationship to nature. Science is the same all over the world. There's no Russian way to design airplanes. There's no Greek way. There's a mathematical way. That's what people have to learn, the meaning of science, not the commercialization of science. When they invented the radio and TV, they put all that crap soap operas on it, and all that crap, TV becomes a bad instrument. Mm -hmm. In fact, most, most people are beginning to realize that. Mm -hmm. Now, you said in your interview with um, Larry King, I think in 1974, it it will take 10 years to transform the face of the earth into a second garden of Eden with the present day technology. That was almost 40 years ago. So with today's present day technology, how long do you think it could take? It isn't how long it would take. We can't get on to the media because the media itself is paid by the monetary system. They get so much for selling cigarettes. But cigarettes always produce cancer if you live long enough. It may take 10 years or 15 years, but it will produce a heart condition and cancer. A society that's sane would not sell cigarettes or any contaminated food. Mm -hmm. so, so do you think that the key to that transition or transformation is getting education. access to media and education? Yes. We have no access. All media thrives on profit. And their major concern is the profit going up. That's where people invest. If your profit is going down, you might work for goodwill. Mm -hmm. There's no goodwill industry, no charity in the future. There's no starvation and no unemployment either. Except as technology advances and people are replaced, this will happen in our own culture. More and more technology will be installed, and people will be laid off, and they'll never get jobs again. And that's when the system dies, when it can no longer support itself, when the public doesn't have the purchasing power to buy products. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. that picture that you paint of the future is very beautiful, but some have said in the past that it, it makes you a very utopian. Are you a utopian? No, because even the cities I design will be changed by future generations. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. If I design a laptop today, it's the best I know of up to now. But ten years from now, it'll be smaller, lighter, and do many more things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe the size of a ring. Your laptop will do all those things. And you won't have to depress keys to talk to it. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, autom automatization takes a central point in your project. Yes. Right? But yes. is that artificial intelligence that you're referring to? Only if it doesn't touch the real world, it's artificial. It should be about the real world. Well, automation means that whatever a man can do, a machine can do better. A doctor has ten tremors per second in his hands. They shake. 
mm-hmm. automated surgery has zero tremors. So in the future, all surgery will be done by machine. Although we say, well, then never, you need a human being there. All that's bill bullshit. Yeah, but let me ask you there, because you already said that people are machines in a way. And you, in just, way. And, yes. and you just gave examples of how machines are better at surgery and, you know, elevator Certain operation things. and certain yes. things. So aren't machines better than us in everything? And if... Aren't they better than in everything eventually? Because as no. we can see, historically speaking, the realm of capabilities of men is shrinking and the realm of capability of machines is expanding. Yes, that's true. But I want to tell you this. They are warning people that machines will take over eventually. And that's not true. Machines will never take over because they have no feelings. Machines do not feel, when you put a good oil in a machine, it doesn't say, thank you for the good oil, I really needed it. It doesn't appreciate anything. If your computer had feelings, it would say, hey, give me a day off, will you? Don't work me Saturday and Sunday and Monday. Give me a day off. No computer has feelings. If you smash a computer in front of 25 brand new ones, they don't say, we'll get you. If it isn't this week or next week, We'll get you. They don't care. Yeah, but that's at this moment of what some people would say are crude level machines, crude level computers. No. When you're talking no, about the true. artificial not intelligence, true. for example, wouldn't that make the machine be able to come up with feelings its own? No, no. no. They, they don't know how to do that. No machine today has any kind of feelings at all. Now, you can get a machine, if you make a face that looks human, to express emotions, yeah. to, to look like they feel. Android. It's like a phonograph record or a movie. Yeah. They don't really feel the loss in a movie of 10 people or 100,000 people. They don't really, the movie doesn't feel it. The actor acts as though he feels it, mm-hmm. but he doesn't really feel it. Mm-hmm. No machine can feel sorry for a person hit by a Mack truck. Mm -hmm. They go right on producing. Jacques, I know your time is very valuable, but I would like to see if if it's possible to keep you for another 15 minutes or so, and I have another 10 quick questions to shoot at you, if if that's okay. Yes, you have the right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So let me just ask a little bit different questions here for a second. That's all right. What's... What's your secret to longevity? You're 97 years old, and you still seem to be going at the energy level of, of a 50-year-old. How do you do that? Because I'm interested in what I'm doing. I feel sorry for people who were brought up in different cultures with these artificial values. It bothers me to see all these suffering people that can't get medical care because they don't have the money. And money, to me, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And I think that's true. Although I don't believe most of the Bible. (laughs) Uh, A different type of question. Do you know who Ray Kurzweil is? And if you do, what do you think of him and his work? Ray Kurzweil. Oh, I think that he's he's very speculative and he's tied down to the culture. He doesn't touch the economic system. No matter what he writes about, he doesn't touch the social system, which is safe avoidance. Mm-hmm. So then, uh, what's your take on what he calls the coming technological singularity? I don't buy that because I don't believe you can make man a half computer and half human. Because there's no final frontiers. There's no best city, no best laptop. It it will change eternally. Man will continue to grow. He will never arrive at any final stage. But he's not saying that we would arrive at a final stage. He just says that that step of going into a technological singularity is a point beyond we cannot see. But that process that you're describing will in fact continue to unfold. And we are going to... The best thing to do is to leave that alone until you get close to it. You, know, you can't speculate on the future because you don't know what inventions are coming up. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. 
Mm-hmm. Well, he says that the good inventor plans always about at least five years ahead of time. He can't. He can't know what's coming up. Mm-hmm. I see. Uh, Jacques, what do you think of death? Well, I don't think about death much, but if you want to know what it's like, I can tell you. It's like things used to be for you 500 years ago. You were dead. That's what Epicurus says. That's why Lucretius says that death is nothing to us, just like it was nothing to us before we were born. And we don't feel sorry for someone who was not born yet. Therefore, he says, we shouldn't fear someone who is dead, because they're basically where they were before us being alive. Yes, that's close enough. Yeah, and he, that's why he claims uh, death is nothing to us. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but I want to find out personally your view in the sense that would you like to continue living another if hundred I'm, years if you could? Yes, if I'm healthy. Yeah. But I'm not sick. I yeah, would want to. Absolutely, yeah, I understand that. Let's say you you, you sustain your current or better... Uh, yes, I would like to live to be Maybe 115 or 120, but no more. Why not 150 or 200? Because in heaven, you live forever. You understand? If you follow the teachings of Jesus, you live forever in heaven. Yeah, but you said you don't believe that, and and I don't believe it either. Let me tell you what I want to tell you. Okay. If you get to heaven and you're 2,000 years old, because you don't die anymore, you wouldn't want to talk to anybody. You've heard it all. <laughs> you know what I mean? It'd be the most painful experience to live forever, which but, people don't think about. They don't even realize that. Don't forget, if you've been around, you don't like to be around children because they can't say anything new. Well, they say, I want a balloon. Billy has a balloon. Buy one for me, Daddy. They don't say anything interesting. And the reason you have children, because they tell you, you get married and you have two children, a boy and a girl, and you send them to college. That's all indoctrination. Children are a pain in the ass. (laughs) How many children do you have yourself? I had two. They died. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I was not aware. Yeah, I was not aware. Um, Another question I have is, Cryonics. What do you think of cryonics? I think it's going to be a big stink when they turn off the machine. (laughs) They will not be revived because there's no sense taking people of the past and putting them into the future. Bring all your relatives there. They have nothing to offer. Yeah, but speaking of science, do you know that it's been a few years now since uh, there was a, I think it was a a rabbit uh, kidney that was uh, cryogenically... Uh, frozen, or actually the, the, yeah. the term is vitrified, yeah. and then it was uh, rethought or basically rejuvenated and reimplanted back into a rabbit, which survived for several months with that organ. And so yeah. the idea is that we have a proof that's of concept. That's not cryonics. That's, what is it? That's something else. That's medicine advancing to be able to grow hearts, so you don't have to donate a heart or a kidney. We'll be able to grow artificial organs made of blood and flesh. I'm not talking about a pacemaker. I'm talking about growing living tissue. And we'll be able to do that, yes. Yeah, organ organ growing and, and uh, 3D printing of bio-organs, yes, I understand that. But my point was that that, rabbit, that rabbit's uh, kidney was taken, surgically removed, and just like you preserve people today with vitrification process in cryonics, the same was done to that uh, kidney. It was stored for a period of time, which I think was several months. Then it was implanted into another rabbit, which survived consequently using that organ for many months. You're right. You're right there. But why should people of the future revive people of the past? Well, because... For example, we might want to hear what Jacques Fresco has to say another couple of... Well, they got recordings of everything he ever said. Yeah, but those recordings were with respect to the context of the time that you're living in today. Perhaps you'd want to see the time of the future and make some comments or assessment. Well, all they have to do is go to the movies and see a movie. Say, my God, it was so backward. 
and shameful and self-centered. It's disgusting. So you no. wouldn't be curious of seeing the future? Not at all. I know how cavemen live. I know that they <laughs> ate each other and they shot each other or killed each other because they felt superior. Mm -hmm. If a man believes... I once asked Einstein whether he believed in God. He said, which one? I asked him if he believed in truth. He said, what do you mean by truth? Mm -hmm. I said, well, that certain things are a certain way. I was once normal. Yeah, and he said to me, like what? He pinned me down and wouldn't let me get away with just words. I said, well, I said, this surface, this surface is smooth on the watch. Yeah. He said, under a microscope, it's coarse. So I said, is that what it's really like? He said, we can't see things as they really are. Because only as our receptors can pick them up. There are radio waves moving through this room, which I can't see. There are germs on the table, which I can't see. So when people use the word consciousness, they are very stupid individuals, because they're assuming they can sense everything. Mm -hmm. They can't be conscious. They can only be as conscious as your receptors. Do you know what that means? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let, let me ask okay. you another question, though, about another per people. I just want to shoot a few of you and then... That would give us all the chance to ponder of what you said and told yes. us. So Very few people will do that. <laughs> Their I, habits of thought are already set in motion. It's very difficult to find objective people. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I don't <laughs> claim I am objective, but I'm trying to be at least to the best I, of my ability. I understand that. Uh, so what do you think of Ayn Rand and the objectivist movement? The what movement? Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged, Insane. Founding Head. Self-centered, spoiled, nothing to do with reality. She's an ignoramus. She was an ignoramus. She's dead now. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that at that. What do, you think at, what do you think of the Zeitgeist movement? Well, I think the Zeitgeist movement did a lot of good work. They pointed out a great many shortcomings in our country. Peter Joseph really did work hard at pointing out the shortcomings. But when somebody said, what can we do about it, he didn't know. So the Zeitgeist movement had nothing to offer to eliminate the problems. Mm -hmm. They talked about the problems, and they were very good at what they talked about. But when you said... What's a better way to design automobiles so they don't hit each other? They didn't know. Well, but <laughs> Peter Joseph embraced your Venus project and your resource-based economy, and now he goes around to answer those questions by saying, what we need is a resource-based economy. That's right. He thinks that's common sense. It isn't. There's no such thing as common sense. There wouldn't be war if there was common sense. I see. Okay, so... Um... I think Peter Joseph is sincere. He's a nice guy. But he doesn't know what to do specifically to change society. Is that the because biggest... he's a filmmaker and not a scientist? Yes. Mm -hmm. He's more of a person with feelings about unemployment and war. He's very much against that, which is very good. Mm -hmm. But it's not enough. You have to offer a new blueprint for how we live and what we learn. If we learn the same things, we're going to do the same things over again. Mm -hmm. Like Einstein said, it's the same values that got us into the problem that we're trying to get us out of the problems. Mm -hmm. And we need new, new kind of thinking to... Yes, different. Yes. Based upon reality, not opinions. I see. Now, in your interview with Larry King in 1974, you said that in 10 or 15 years from now, our society will go down in history as the lowest development of men. We have the brains, the know-how, and the technology to build an entirely new civilization. I, yes. like, I like that quote, but I want to give you another quote that you gave just a couple moments after that in the, during this interview, and I want to ask you to comment on it. You said, the direction we're moving in gives us 25 years to total environmental destruction. We have seven years to mass starvation. 
we don't have much time. So I want to ask you, do you feel that this really happened because you did that interview in 1974? I really said if we don't go to war, it's World War II that pulled us out of the recession. The war was Germany, Japan, Italy, and Spain. Yeah. That pulled us out. Everybody went back to work making bombs and weapons. We didn't pull out due to ingenuity. We don't use science. We use science the wrong way in a monetary system. We use television for commercials rather than informing the public in better ways of thinking about things. See, children will be brought up in the future not to want to fight one another, but to understand one another. And one child will say to another, what do you think of what I said? He said, I have to look into it further before I answer that. Mm -hmm. They won't say, well, you're wrong. You know, they won't get into fights or arguments. Neither will married couples. So you don't think that we are approaching a sort of a collapse? Yes, we are, but not based upon knowledge. We're based upon collapse because we choose erroneous directions. Yeah, but my previous point was, didn't you say that that in 1974 that we have, you know, 25 years to total environmental destruction and seven years to mass starvation? And so, in other words, you said that before and kind of didn't seem to happen. Yes, but uh, that is, if they use the scientific method, we could solve these problems, but we're not using it. it so why didn't it happen then, since 1974? Because there's no money in it. We work for money. If you ask an industry what the bottom line is, they say profit, not the human being, well-being. We, our major concern is the well-being of people all over the world. No more poverty, no more hunger, mm -hmm. no more prisons, no more police. Because what makes a prisoner? This is the question. What makes war? Why do people kill each other? You have to understand what makes that. And if you want to say what makes it, you can weed it out of the upbringing. Mm -hmm. Jacques. The last two questions that I always ask of people on my show are always the same. And the first one is, where can people find more about you and your work? TheVenusProject.com That's the best place. Well, there's a book called uh, The Best That Money Can't Buy. Mm -hmm. I've written that book some years ago, but it, it'll update you, showing you a new way of thinking about everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I would suggest... You read that book first, then call for questions. Uh -huh. Because most of your questions are culture-bound. You know what I mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. I am I am of the old world you describe. There's no doubt about it in most ways. Yeah, but I trust you. That's why I'm on the show. Thank you. Uh, and I, I trust your sincerity. And your book is actually on my reading list for sure, and I do plan to read it. I will read it. So there are also pictures of what the new world might look like. Yeah, actually, I, I really like your uh, sketches and your pictures, your designs. They look very interesting, very fresh, very unique, very different. I really, really appreciate those. Uh, but let us finish our interview here with the last and perhaps most important question, which is, we've been talking here for an hour and 15 minutes with you, so... What is the most important thing that you would like people to take away from this conversation with you today? To study the meaning of science and applying the methods of science to the social system. We always ask scientists to make new bombs, an atom bomb or something like that. But when they drafted me in the army, they said, can you make a bomb that explodes sideways instead of up? I said, I don't know how to do that. I know how to do that, but I won't. I would never give the atom bomb to any nation because they're too stupid to utilize it wisely. I'm against the space program. You wouldn't gather that. I'm against the space program if single nations go out into space. If we learn to live together on Earth, then we go out into space. As a joint venture, I feel better about that. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid of single nations going out there, because I think we'll have nuclear weapons going around in outer space with the value system we have today. 
I'm afraid of the leaders of the world today. They're very much alike and very stupid, poorly informed. Mm -hmm. Jacques Fresco, thank you very much for taking so much time of your day to be with us today. Really appreciate it. Whenever you want to further this conversation, let me know. Thank you. I would love to come and visit you in person one day and shake your hand and, and just uh, maybe you Please. can show me some drawing technique. People come all from all over the world on Saturday mm -hmm. to, to hear this new thing. What is it? It's nothing like any other system. They say, is it a form of communism? No, it's not. Communism has warships, airplanes, bombers, poison gas, nerve gas. They have all the things we have. And that's nothing like communism, socialism, or any other ism. It's different than any culture ever tried before. Mm -hmm. So we must read the book. Yes. If okay. you really, really want to know. If we care. Yes, I agree. I agree don't, with you. Don't ask your neighbor, what do you think of the Venus Project? Yeah. Ask if he's read the book. Yes, I agree Thank entirely. You. Okay. Thanks very much, Jack. Thank you for the opportunity.